Hey, and welcome to the last uh, session of the London Internet Festival 2022. This is the 19th edition, and we're really pleased to be back here at the Genesis Cinema, who have been amazing. So thank you to Genesis, and also thank you to all our other partners and supporters. Thank you to Scriptwrite for doing the session today. And we have our closing feature at 6 p.m. and that is when the screen starts directed by Connor Coru. And then we have our award ceremony and closing night party tonight from 8 to check out. And now we have this session, so I'll pass over. Thank you very much. Oh, wow, it's so weird to hear in the so long here in your head and it gets pushed out of speaker behind you and go, my God, my voice is awful. <laughs> um, hello, um, I'm Owen. And I'm Buddy. And we're Scribbrant. Um, the way, we'll explain who we are and what we do in a second. The way that this afternoon uh, we have plans to run is that we will tell you who we are, what we do, what development is, because it's part of the filmmaking process and not very many people know what's involved in. Um, we're going to try and bust some myths as well about development a little bit. But the main body of today, hopefully, will be about you guys. Because uh, our job is we like asking, answering writers' questions and helping them with their story knots. So if you guys have any knots in any projects you're working on at the moment, or um, general inquiries about how do I structure my script, or whatever, any script questions, that's why we call it a script surgery. It's more about you guys. Um, about us. So if you have any questions, that's great. If you don't, that's also cool. We've got some other things that we can talk about, but we'd be interested to know what's on your minds. Yeah. Well, um, first of all, I'm Maggie Fry. I'm the co-founder of ScriptWrite. Um, my background is I was a journalist for many years, so I'm, um, I've written for the Daily Telegraph, I've been Post, and New Statesman, um, and I moved into script development, and I've written for and done script analysis, script coverage for American companies like the Hamptons International Film Festival in New York, Coverfly in California, and some production companies here like Big Lights and Fancy Ledge. Um, and Owen and I realised we have very similar ambitions. We love writers, we love stories, and we love analysing scripts and seeing how we can make them better and make them the best version of themselves they can be. And we realised we have a similar aim, so we decided to partner up. Yeah, um, I'm um, Fidley, my full name. Um, I was an actor for several years and then realised that was a silly job and uh, then realised, as Maddie said, that we had to share a lot of stories and work with writers and things. Um, I have worked with um, the Hampton Song Festival, like Maddie has, and also I have worked with Sister Productions and Red Pan Productions and um, done some stuff for them. I've also worked with the Park Theatre, if anyone knows the Park Theatre in North London, if you haven't, they have a cool new writing theatre, so I'm going to stay there for yeah, that's who we are. Um, I think now we'll talk a bit about what Scriptwrite actually does and how we can maybe help you if you're a writer or if you're in any part of the film process, really. Uh, we also work with playwrights and people writing for TV as well, and people who write for audio. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and then I'll go a little bit in depth about what some of our packages are and how we help people. And then we'll talk a bit about what development is. And then we'll get pretty soon to how we can help you guys in terms of what problems you might have in your writing. Or you just don't really like advice on general questions. Yeah, so what we do is, as I said, we like working with writers at any stage. You often get asked a question, uh, people come up to us and go, oh, I'm not ready to show you my script. And we go, we don't care, we want to see your script. Um, or your idea. I mean, we have, um, I worked on a play, was it two weeks ago? That was literally just dialogue. I mean, the writer just said, this is an idea for a play, it's really good. I mean, these are the things you can improve with. Or I have stage directions. Um, but um, so we work with writing projects at any stage, and we want to work with writers at any level um, to help you guys improve your stories and um, to make your project work as well as it possibly can do. As I said, we work, as I said, we work with, in the last year and a half, we have worked with um, a script outline for a circus performance, a short film, a feature film, a television comedy, a short horror film. Uh, several plays and even a children's book. So we will do stories in anything. That's what we do. 
in terms of um, how we are different um, to what other script analysis or script reading companies might be is that we we can do anything from say a very short one page report saying what works, what doesn't, to we do in depth one on one mentoring over Zoom or in person. People who really want to go deep on how to make their script better. And one thing we realised as well is that a lot of writers get very unhelpful feedback. They get things that are too vague, like don't let the characters overwhelm the story, which um, if you've ever received that, you'll know, be like, how, when, what do I do with that? So we, we default or demystify feedback people might have had before for other parts of the industry and say, okay, how can we link this to concrete examples in your script where we can make this better? Um, so we have a whole demystifying bad feedback you might have had before package. Um, so yeah, and we work with film teams as well, as well as individuals. And I just stress again, yeah, we work with people at any stage. There's we see it as most people want to get to the point where they pitch to agents or to film festivals or to competitions. They're somewhere along the journey and we see it as, you know, you're A, you want to get to C, we're B, we help you get there. So that is what we do. And we're always very keen to hear from new writers, how we can help you, how we can work with you. And I think now we're going to talk a bit about what actually is development, because um, a lot of people think, you know, films, plays, they think what's on the stage, what's on the TV. Um, what's on set, they think about the actual nuts and bolts stuff that um, involves the camera. Well, we're the pre bit where you have development, you have production, you have post-production, we development. We tend to be very office-based. Um, this is still relevant for directors and producers because we form a vital component of basically what a production is and can be by just taking more ideas and helping them develop. And a script is a huge part of that. Um, and we basically make sure the script is fit for purpose and fulfills creative and financial requirements. The financial requirements is big, quite a big part of it. We are an independent film festival, so people aren't going to be working with marvel size budgets, basically. Um, yeah, that would be very nice. Yeah, it would be. No, don't be wrong. It would be really good. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a funny world, because it's a thing that a lot of people don't know exists. Um, the sort of this thing that if you don't know exists, you just think that scripts just happen. And then when you realize it exists, you realize how important it is. Um, and how involved it is. Um, and it continues even on to, um, so it can start with an idea. So, for example, uh, a writer friend of mine um, is gone with a partner of hers to a television production company with an idea for a historical figure they found at the end of the 20th century. And they go, she's really cool, we want her to see series like that. And they go, that's cool, here's, here's money to go write an idea about it. Or you can bring through their script. Do a production company and this is really cool changing three things. And that journey continues even onto the set. So the super development team will often be the person who knows in production, who knows the script almost as well as the writer. The good developer, a good script editor, will be with you as the writer through the whole development process. And then they will be your voice on set. So the, the first AD will come and go, for example, I heard an um, a TV series where the writers had written this big breakup scene between the two main lover characters, and they wanted them to be walking along a cliff with a storm going in the background, because, you know, pathetic phallus and all that kind of stuff. And then they went, we don't have the budget to take everyone down to Cornwall and have a storm in the background. Can we do this scene in the kitchen? And the script editor had to go, yes, yes, we can do this in the kitchen, because we don't have the money to do it on a cliff. And so they will liaise with the production office and the writer and oversee the rewrites to make sure that the scene in the kitchen is as good as the scene on the cliff was. And so they perform a vital link between you guys as writers and the actual filmmakers. So that's a bit about what development is. And now I think we're going to do a bit of myth busting before we get to the QA. But of course, at any point, if anyone has a point they'd like to make or a question, please do just. Yeah, or we can just shout out what it's welcome to. Um, Don't encourage heckling, I think. Oh, yeah, you're sorry, yeah. <laughs> you're right, yeah. yeah. Um, like an actor. No, it's fine. Uh, I have friends with stand ups, so I'm scarred by tangent. Anyway, um, sorry. Um, don't give me a microphone and an audience, it's a bad thing. Um, a myth that I think a lot of people feel about any sort of script, and I think you have it any, as any sort of creative person, whether you're a musician or an actor or a painter or anything is that you see the final finished product and you think, that has had no help. That person up there came out absolutely, perfectly, fully formed, like the way Mozart used to write music. 
The only person I know who has a fully formed creative artist, artistic perfection is Mozart. Everyone else has needed help. Everyone else has written an absolutely terrible script. Has painted an absolutely awful painting. Has put in an absolutely terrible performance. Because that's what being an artist is. You spend a large amount of time being rubbish. And then you practice and you get better. And even like Phoebe Waller Bridge through to um, uh, Quentin Tarantino, through to anybody you can think of that makes genius pieces of art, will have had someone else help them develop their work. And I think it's a big thing we come across a lot with um, writers at the stage, or especially creating stuff at this kind of level of festival, of going, I have to do it on my own, I have to do it on my own, because, using her again as an example, Phoebe Waller Bridge did it. You know, she took a show to Edinburgh and got turned into a TV show, and she's amazing. So, yes, she is amazing, but she would have had help along the way from a development team, from her directors. It's absolutely normal as a writer of scripts, at whatever level, to have someone like us go, This is amazing, but change your secondary character slightly to make it even more amazing. So, don't feel bad if you feel you need to ask people for advice. Because everybody does it. Everybody. And on the other end of the scale from that, we sometimes encounter people who just go, oh, my script just isn't ready for someone to see it. And again, that's a myth because your script in many ways will never be truly ready. There will come a point where you have to let it go and say, okay, it's someone somewhere down the line will decide it's ready to go forward and be used. But it's going to go through so many redraftings and so many reiterations, different forms. There's not ever going to be a point where you're probably ever going to feel it's truly ready, unless you're super self-confident or, you know, which people are, a lot of people are not. Um, so, as I stressed before, if you want to get to C and you're at A, at some point you will have to go through B. So, there really is no point at which your script is not ready enough. I was working with somebody recently who had started out as a performance poet and written a play. She's now writing something for audio drama. Um, she wants to try and get it produced on Radio 4. Her script was in a very, very raw form, but we worked on it together and basically pretty much rebuilt it from the ground up, which was amazing and very satisfying and a great process to go through with somebody. So um, her ideas were very, very kind of rough and ready, but you know, we all went the first time until rough. So that's, um, that's a great part of doing what you do, really, um, is that there's no such thing as not being ready. Um, did she get to Oh, she did. So yeah, which is very satisfying. We need to put that on the website, we have to put that on the website, so we should, we should, we should do that. Um, the thing is that a lot of people do is they they take that piece of advice from Maddie and go, I know what I'll do, I will show my script to my mum, and or fill in blank the emotional support person. Which is fine, but your friends and relations will nearly always have a dependent relationship with your mum, um, be nice to you. And it's always useful to have somebody to sound board. But at some point, um, you'll need somebody who isn't related to you to read your work. Because they will get all your injects, all your references, all the things you're trying to get because they know you. They will also not want to give you any bad feedback. They might read it and go, oh my word, this is like, a bit wonky, but I will, I will just say nice things. Or they'll just go, no, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. That's an amazing line out for. Like, what am I meant to do with all of that feedback? Because of their emotional relationship to you. So it's always really useful to give your script to someone who's dispassionate about it. who will give you a proper professional assessment of what's going on. And again, it's a scary thing to do, uh, but it is a useful thing to do, to have somebody outside of your social network read your work. There's also a thing that once you've given it to someone to read, they are no longer a blank canvas. So if you give them draft one, you can't give them draft two, because they know what draft one is like. So you cannot reassess what draft two is like, because they're going through the lens of draft one. So marry your readers, and try and make them not emotionally connected to you, because that makes that complicated. And to add to that, I think one of the best pieces of advice I've ever given generally as a writer when I was writing a book was I mean, some of you might have had this. So many people will say to you, oh, can I read your screenplay, can I read your novel? And then they just won't. You email it to them, and then a year later, and every time they see you, they'll go, oh, I'm gonna read it, I'm gonna read it, and that gets a bit awkward, because it's like, you don't have to, you don't have to, I get you busy, and 
the fact is, they just got broke too. And if they do, they're not going to tell you what anything you don't want to hear. So, um, and then slightly to expand on the first myth, a lot of people really do feel that this must be a very solitary process. That being a writer is something you really just have to have on your own. But I've had plenty. I've known plenty of people who just want to keep their work very close to their chest and have nobody read it at all. The other end of the scale and. Somebody is going to have to read this if you want to be professional in any way. Um, if the person reading it is any good, they won't be cruel, even if they have things to say that are constructive. They won't be dick about it. And if they are, find someone else. Um, but it's, for a lot of people, writing is private passion, that's fine. If you just want to write for yourself, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But if you dream of maybe getting it produced or getting something published, someone somewhere will have to read it at some point. So. It'll feel we sold the myth of the writer alone in their garret, you know, sort of dying of consumption or something. But the reality is, for a lot of people, there'll come a point where it's a collaborative process. Um, so that's that's all myth development. But it's you know, writers don't always work completely on their own. There will come a point where it's where we're all in this together, basically. So. Basically, the point of development is to hold your hand and go, "It's okay. We'll help you do your thing." Because we all love stories and want your stories to be as good as they can. And everyone I've spoken to developing just loves watching stuff and reading stuff and engaging in stuff and the point of the job that we do is to bring writers into that world and hold their hands through because we love stories in kind of other exciting and exciting way. Anyway, that's kind of who we are, what we do, kind of what the world of Berlin is. I hope some of that was clear and useful. Um, now this is the point where if anybody has any questions that you have about anything you're working on, or the writing process in general, or anything like that. Yes, yeah. okay. Um, just a quick question. When you are given submissions, I mean, where, where do you feel are the most, you know, is it more character, is it more acts, is it more, you know, plot? I mean, where do you feel that people tend to flounder when they're coming to you, when they're, when they're stuck in their, in their process? It's a whole range, really, pretty much all the things you mentioned. Um, I mean, one thing I'm noticing quite a bit is people are still really tripping up a lot on writing women, um, male and female writers. And there's obviously so much pressure, rightly, on the industry at the moment to get women right. But um, it's, you were saying this recently, is it? A lot of male writers trip up and think that they have to make every woman a badass. And that in itself, that's great, but does it make someone well rounded and believable? Um, so that can be, I think, character is still an area where people trip up on, and also structure. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Because it's one of your work there as well. I can do, yeah. I think, well, as Marley said, it's basically anything. It really does, it's a little bit like how long was a piece of string. That, uh, like, I had a project last, last year where um, everything completely worked, but her second, she had a secondary antagonistic character that she'd made too awful. So it, doesn't kind of work, so she, that's what needs changing. Then we had a short film where the, the, where the structure was a bit off and they were shown, so it really does depend on, it really does depend on from project to project, there's no kind of, oh, all the writers we work with can't do B plots, for example. Um, uh, yeah, something that I often find not often find in some of the things that I watch is that the structure is off. It's, it's, often it sounds towards the end of Act 2, if it's between rich classical movie structure, um, or it just goes on way too long at the end. And um, I'm a big acolyte of Zemmer and Noga, I'm sure you all do, since you're here, the Blake Snyder book, Save the Cat. If you don't read it, because it's amazing, um, it's called Save the Cat. Um, it's an extremely good book on how to write a commercial film, but actually, all of the advice is applies to everything um, and um, it's all of, if he has like a formula of exactly when things should happen which I am quite a uh, extreme structuralist like yes it happens on page 18 and that's when it happens um, so it doesn't have to be that good that but it's quite useful that we as, as species have instinctive structures for stories um, and actually if you look at good stories it falls into that Another structure that's really useful to think about is if anyone familiar with Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey, if you're not, it's worth Googling, um, which is 
it sounds like it's, but he takes the models of stories from across all history and finds a basic general plot, which is a circle, which we start at one point, go through the series and then come back to where you were changed. And actually for all stories, that works. And if you compare, this is a weird two films to compare, Spider-Man No Way Home and Nomadland, they have the same circular structure, that's why they work. My theory is the reason why Spider-Man No Way Home is such a success is, yes, it's Marvel and Spider-Man is cool, um, but also it follows the proper beat structure of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, so people instinctively buy into it. If you look at No Man Land, the Francis McDermott character goes through the same set of journeys as the hero's journey, but on a very subtle, smaller emotional level, because it's an indie film. But it's still there. So actually, if you look at the films that work, they do follow the classical preconceived structure, even though they might not seem to. Hasn't Dan Harmon from the court also done his own version of that? Dan Harmon has also kind of repacked his own circle screw structure. Yes, sorry. Um, but the structure is actually there to help you. 
um, and it can be a it can be a framework in which you can then flip things around. Have you seen Omega Destroy You, the Michael Troll TV thing? It was on now two years ago. I may destroy you. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, I mean that was amazing. Yeah, it completely changed. I mean, what an amazing version, and especially the final episode completely changed the completely ripped the story structure. But actually, this there was an awful lot of standard structure going on the way Michael Cole wrote those episodes, but she still made an incredibly challenging. The kind of thing that I feel that you'd like to make kind of television. Really challenging, really upsetting in the right way. But there were there are some standard story beats that can help you. So I think when you say the word structure, especially writers, they go, No, but I want to do crazy stuff and break stuff and be new and innovative. And of course the whole point of making art is not to just rewrite stuff. But it's actually there to help you, like a poetical form. You can write a poetical form it is a form of description. It's also a form of support. And that's how I do structure. Is it's not a confinement, it's a support system to help give you some way to hang the layers off. If that answers your question. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, one small thing I would add to that is um, and apologies, I'm starting a sentence with saying, I think it was Tolstoy that said, um, that I have to give credit if I'm not doing that. Uh, Every story is either a man walks into a village, or a stranger walks into a village, or a man goes on a journey. And if you think about it, pretty much everything else fits into that. But if you can write out of that, fantastic. That's a, I think that's a great goal. And you might find you still come back to that in some way. But I'd say also don't be disappointed if you do, because as Owen said, it's support, not necessarily a cage. with my characters if I feel like I need to get to know them better. <laughs> 
That's a really good idea. <laughs> so it's like, you know, I find out their backstory and then I can actually go back to who they are. Kind of like hot seating. Sorry? Kind of like hot seating. Where you sit and you interview them and find out what backstory is. I actually sit and I start a conversation with myself. Sounds really <laughs> no, that's, I think that's a good idea. I think that's a good idea. <laughs> um, and I just, it's like I have that conversation with them which then makes me have to respond on their point of view. So normally I'm okay with characters, but I'm finding in this particular one that I've got I've got the main character who I'm wanting particular things to come across from. But I don't know if he's becoming too passive at times with other characters. I've got quite a strong female character mm -hmm. and I don't know if he's becoming a little bit passive and I don't know how to get that balance. I don't want to lose her, but I don't want to lose him for that reason, because mm -hmm. he's the main character. Mm -hmm. so, but she's kind of a second character, but she's, she's the main character as well. So it's just trying to not get that. It sounds right. Yeah, yeah, not yeah. lose him to passive and have him still active. But it's just, I don't know if there's any tips on how to bring him back. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I think maybe put him in a difficult situation. Let's see how that changes him and throw a challenge his way. Um, I mean, do you have a sense of the top of your head of what at the moment we think he's too passive? Um, yeah, it tends to be when he's in scenes with her. So I don't know if it's the dialogue. I don't know if maybe she's just a bit too much. Are there any scenes where he's by himself? Yeah, that's so I basically I'm having him I'm trying to focus on PTSD because there's a lot of misconception around PTSD and it's not actually a veteran's illness. Um, so it's kind of like when he's dealing with that, obviously that's on his own. But he's got a different character which comes in and is very... Like them, their two characters is great. I like the way that they're working. But it's just this... I don't know. I don't know if she's just too overpowering. I don't know how to bring her down without losing her qualities, if that makes sense. Because I don't want to lose her and who she is, but I don't want to have, have her overpower him yeah. as well, if that makes sense. Yeah, of course. Um, two thoughts. One, which might not be very helpful at all. I think part of our job is throwing out unhealthy thoughts <laughs> and then to allow you guys to reject them. One is, if she is coming out as the main driver of the story, Maybe she's your main character, and he is—he's the thing that makes her learn lessons. If that's what's coming out, she's the main driver, and your main character should be the one that drives the story. So I don't understand where you're coming from. Maybe she's actually your main character. One idea. The second idea is that if um, you create every scene between every, every character that they walk into the scene wanting something. They want to achieve something from that scene. Um, like the standard pretentious hollow actor, what's my motivation for the scene? Like give him a moment, like he, want, he walks into a room, he wants to, very simple, I want to get across the side of the room and make a cup of coffee. And she comes in and stops him. And he's like, that's his obstacle. So if he has a strong, give him a strong enough intention in every scene he's in, like he wants something. That will give him a drive. We all want something, and if we want something hard enough, we'll fight for it. It might be that all his his want in all his scenes with her isn't strong enough. Like he doesn't need anything out of that scene, he just sort of is in it. But give him a need just to get out of that scene, whatever it is, and that might give him a bit more fuel. I suppose it also depends on their relationship. Like if they have a compatible you could even call her out and say you're overpowering me too much and you know, you don't get to say anything around you, you dominate all of our conversations and that could be, you know, a spark that sort of leads to something. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was that helpful. Yes, thank Good. you. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
form, like story that matching form. I don't know if I'm asking that very clearly. Like I'm writing something now that feels too short to to. Is it because I'm just not fleshing out my characters? Is there is there some kind of a checklist for so a you serial? Can, you trying to work out whether you're writing a film or a TV series? Yeah. 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 That's fair. I think it's if you as we talk with reporting, I don't think there is a a definite piece of advice you go this, this tells you that you're writing of this and this tells you you're writing of this. I think the piece of advice I saw for writing a kind of a limited series mm -hmm. example, is that you write it like a movie but in four acts. So it's a four parter. So yeah, they true. have they have a yeah, they like in a, in a movie, you have a main character who wants to achieve something, and then there are a series of obstacles in their way. You set that out in the first episode, and then the next three episodes are them thinking they're going to get it, failing to get it, and getting it. But if you don't feel you have enough materials for a four part series, maybe you, don't, maybe you just don't have a four part series, and that's okay. I mean, if you look at all the streaming services, they're, making, they're still making movies, and Netflix is making Oscar worthy movies and that's on streaming service. So if you feel you've only got two hours worth of a story, that's fine. And actually people will thank you for writing a two hours worth of a story because the movies are way too long now. So write write a nice one hour fifty eight minute movie and everyone will be like and I'll watch the shit out of your movie. <laughs> I think there's one as well if you're if you're worried that your character say and not fleshed out enough, which is part of your earliest what you were saying as well. There's a really good book called um, The Science of Writing Characters by Kira Ann Pelican. Uh, the Science of Writing Characters, Kira Ann Pelican. Um, and um, I think Pelican's got the K as well. Um, and she does a really good. She's really good. Yes, excellent. Like, um, and she does a lot of talks and things, and she does quite a lot of events and seminars, so she's a great person to follow and watch. But, um, she talks about how characters need to ideally have more like four to five dimensions to them rather than just three, because people talk about characters being 3D, but actually she talks about various axes you can use, like say the internet X to go warm, the character cold or warm. Do you and if you sit down and think about your character and think do they have you know and if you think about personality traits as like five different groups of adjectives, and you think if you can't come up with an adjective from at least four of those groups for your character that might mean they're not fleshed out enough of that might be okay well then how how am I going to have more of this from this group so that's a really good exercise if you feel like your script is lacking in some way I'd say particularly on an area of character or you're struggling to know what to do with the character another good book and it, it actually helps even if you're writing stuff for screen is On Playwriting by Stephen Jeffries um, Stephen Jeffries is the guy who wrote The Libertine, it's probably one of his best known for writing, which got turned into not very good Johnny Depp movie, but the play is very good. He's a really good playwright, and his book, I think it's called On Playwriting, but he's called Stephen Jeffries. He gives really good advice on, on, on a similar vein to Pelican book, which is also very good, um, but just as a different angle on things. But just to come back to it, I don't think it matters Write the, write the thing that comes out of your brain and that will be the form it needs to be. It'll find the form it needs to be. Unless, I mean, unless you're commissioned to just write the fourth part serial and then write the thing. But if you're just playing around with you have a story in your head that needs, and you know where that story needs to go, write that story. It might be a short film, it might be a feature film, it might be a three part series. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. I don't think it matters. I think they, there are some absolutely beautiful short stories that would be awful novels, you know? And but we all love the short story. Like The Christmas Carol, one of the most famous stories ever told, is not a novel. It's a short, it's a novella at best. To write the story in, in the way that it needs to be told. Don't worry about, I have to fit into Netflix's model. Write the story in my right. I did start a film which was a feature film. But it's now turned into a short. Yeah, see, so this is how. So, after writing it, it's, it's changed yeah. now, and I've realised actually I can condense it down. Yeah. I think I agree with that before. Yeah. It started as a long thing, and then actually. You realise that you don't need these bits. Does everyone know the Neil Gaiman novel? Um, it's now a play Ocean at the End of the Lane. You may have seen the poster for it, although it's a really book. Um, I'm a big Neil Gaiman fan. 
he started writing a short story and it just carried on and just turned into a novel. Because that's how the story came out. So let the story come out the way it wants to come out. And you'll be fine. Just, yeah, following on a bit from that about, um, I don't know how involved you are with industry, but from the TV commissioner's point of view, do you have to steer at all on what they're kind of looking for? It's a bit difficult because they always say, we know it when we see it. But do you, have you got an idea yourselves about trends right now? Because um, you can spend two years writing something and then you think it's just not what anyone's looking for. Right now, so. Yeah. That's a really tricky one because it's notorious for the industry. Um, I'm getting the sense at the moment that there's, um, there's obviously a lot of pressure for more diverse stories, like more voices, sort of more working class voices, more non white voices, um, more women's voices, um, things that deal with mental health. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the things that deal with very relevant political issues, but that one's always a tricky one because. You know, the Hammerhead's Tale, they were just super lucky that, that well, lucky is probably the wrong word, but it came out when Trump was elected and they had to change nothing, but they were going to do it that way anyway, so it's, um, and there's always the risk that something might be far ahead of its time, so I think it's, I think keeping it, I'd say honestly, the instinct I tend to follow is, what do you think is not there at the moment? You were talking about PTSD, that's a really good example, like, um, if you feel you're not seeing enough of something on screen or on stage, write that, you know, and write what you know about it. I think the, the little I know, and it, what I've picked up is that they don't want period stuff, because it's really expensive. And did you say that somebody did um, work with a historical drama? Did you say that at the beginning, or was that just a, um, a theoretical? When you started to speak, you were saying something about a historical TV thing that you'd worked with. Oh, yeah. That would be example. Was it where the two people were going to be on a cliff top, but they said oh, that's that too expensive? Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that oh, wasn't yes, okay. So same thing. Expensive. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's expensive, and, and unless it's Bridgerton and they know everyone loves it, it's going to be really difficult to make. Or if you're Jack Thorne and you go, hey, I'm going to write something, and they go, cool, Jack, just write it. <laughs> we'll pay you. Um, the, but I, I was a, with a talking to a writer a long time ago now, the fourth bit, um, that it's, there's so much content being made and it's a wall. There is an actual wall going between Apple, Amazon, Netflix, BBC, ITV. No, there's a new one, Warner Brothers, isn't there? Yeah, exactly. There's a new, like, everybody needs Content, content is there are all these people's terrible metaphor weapons. It's their armaments. They need content. So then, if you write something that you genuinely think is good, write the story you want to write. They will probably need it um, because people need stuff for people to watch. Um, I think a great example is um, it's a sin, you know, absolutely fantastic five part series. Because partly because there was so little being dramas written about the AIDS crisis in that period, that's why Russell T. Davis wanted to write it. So even though obviously it's set in the 80s, it had a lot of resonances because of the pandemic. And so yeah, I think it's as you say, write what you write what you want to write, and it'll, it'll find it's good. It'll find an audience. Uh, I think the sorry, sorry, sorry John, sorry. Um, I was just going to say the only thing I say not to write is about me. I'm a straight, straight, white, middle class man. Don't try to be about me, there's enough about us. Write something else. That's the only thing I'd say not straight about. Sorry. I just wanted to know, because obviously we, it seems to me every other week we have some new um, product on a streaming platform. You know, and you look on Amazon, it's like where all this is coming from. Do you know roughly, is there a backlog of projects that people have? Do they, you know, in terms of how the streaming platforms work, do they, because obviously, you know, I see on Netflix, for example, there's a lot of vintage movies coming out, so Three Days of the Condor's one. But in terms of the content that they're producing exclusively for the streaming things, is there a backlog? I mean, have they got like a couple of years, two or three years that they, they have? Is that yes. how they Basically, yeah. Right. Development lasts anything between, if you get something made within two years, you've made it quickly. So there'll be stuff being picked up by the streamers now that we will see in 2030. It take, can take that long, it depends where you're starting from, but um, 
Is there, is people read the book The Power by Naomi Alderman? Naomi Alderman. Read, it's a really good book. Um, they are, it's a fiction book, it's not a writing advice book, um, but they are turning that into a TV series. But that book came out five? Yeah, so six years ago that book came out. They are still making the TV show. Um, it's going to be coming out next year, I think. So that's seven years after the book came out. So yes, there is a backlog. The development, maybe we should have said before, development takes ages. And it's a very, it is the fastest moving iceberg in the world. In that it takes ages and then stuff just happens. So if you, if it takes a while for your project to move, that it happened with everyone. It takes ages. And this book was massive. It was a really popular book. Yeah, it was like the Women's Prize. Yeah, sure. and it's being produced by um, Sister Productions, who are the guys behind um, This Is Gonna Hurt and Chanel. Mm -hmm. yeah, they're a huge production company, but they're still taking seven years to make it. Um, so, yes, there is a big backlog of stuff. Because no, I think that was what happened with The Irishman, because again, that was a book that they that they wanted to do, Scorsese and De Niro wanted to do, then of course there was the logistics of it, you know, it cost like 100 million, mm -hmm. and Netflix said, well, we'll, we'll take it on board, because it was just amazing how big it was, so that was my curiosity, was the fact that, you know, you know, you go onto Netflix and there's all this wonderful, you know, you, this, you know we scroll it, but it's like, where is this all this come from, because that's, that was the interesting thing that occurred to me about it, so yeah, mm -hmm. so, the frustrating flip side of that is that stuff can be in development for ages, but then for whatever reason it might fall through, you know, because of funding, funding all that. So. I think we um, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, so I thought that was a technical thing I'm going, guys, shut up, please. Oh, no. Go. the question that you asked as well um, but it's a, it's a work it's good um, I wouldn't be f I would think about it remember you're not writing a novel so you don't need interesting adjectives and interesting adverbs which one sounds like a really kind of like I'm teaching you 11 plus but like um, trust your director and DOP they know they know how to make a movie so you don't need to put in, and this is the thing, which just a general thing, don't put in shots, shot sites. You don't need to do that. Because the director will know that this is a wide, this is a close up, this is a two shot, this is a whatever. Um, if you, hopefully, if you have a film made, you will trust the director you're working with, that they will understand your vision for your film. Wally, oh sorry. Okay. Wally is a fantastic uh, script to read. It, because there's almost no dialogue in Wally. Is it, is it, is it yeah, it's good yeah. That's a brilliant script. Like, and it just reads beautifully, but it's extremely well. It's all visual. It's all visual. So I would be worried about it. It's the thing that I, when I'm doing my script reading, the thing I really like is when I read a, read a, a screenwriter who understands that it is a visual medium. I think that there is a worry that people overwrite their dialogue. I have to tell the thing through what the characters say. You, know, you, they can, you can have a beautiful shot and they say one thing. But you just, just tell them what the shot is, as simply as you can, and we'll get it. Um, don't worry about going, there is a beautiful orange tinge sunset over the kind of thing. Just be as simple and clean as you can, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. As simple and clean as you can, don't leave the shot tight. We'll be fine with it up, I think. Sorry, if you have anything yeah. to add on. I was just going to say, recommend um, reading Eternal Sunshine, the screenplay for that, because not only is it just visuals, it's also really complex visuals, the way they're like stitching together the fact that like environments are blending and there's no simple way of just saying like where a scene is and like outlining it as you would a typical scene. So 
for sort of a complex, not just visual storytelling, but like really complex visual storytelling. Do you recommend that as a Oh yeah, check that out. So, um, and it, it goes back a little bit to what you were saying about don't make films about uh, you, because there's enough uh, things about white cisgendered men, but I am... Um, so, my problem with my script, and my, the one that I really, really want to make, is that I want, what I want to basically make a film by the Dakota Access Pipeline, and the Native American, and the, the, the world protectors, and all the myth around it. And, and the kind of fight of lots of different people coming together. Um, and, but I also want to kind of link it to like mental health and our attachment to nature uh, and what happens when everyone gets together and actually fights that fight together uh, against the sort of powers that we do, the disconnect. So it's basically called Working Time to Disconnect. My massive problem with it is that I've basically been told you can't do that in cultural appropriation. You can't do anything about the Native Americans. And, um, but the story is so powerful. Uh, and it's kind of like, a, I think, a kind of, you know, I'm going to make films that sort of, you know, educate people on stuff they do not know, they do not think about, that, that, that is not available or immediately accessible in our in that cultural narrative. And so for that, I, I feel like it's like a world changing film, uh, potentially. But I have this thing that I, 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 someone said, find a Native American co writer. But then, like, I feel like that's even worse. Like, come along and just get on board my film. So I can, I mean, you know, I'd be like, you can write all the dialogue of that. But it's my film, and I'm like trying to hire somebody just to get them on board just so that so I can. To be your token it's, person. Pardon? To be your token person. Yeah. Which I don't feel right about. I mean, I would obviously, I wouldn't. I, I would go about it like I want to make a film that's about your voice when you work with me, when you talk to me about this stuff, and tell me the things that yeah, you know, I don't know. Well, write write the bits, and I'll write just the white stuff, and you can write the rest, <laughs> which is a lot. Um, if you like the ideas that I have, and you want to talk about this too. But um, then I got told, so I got, I got that advice from two different people, and then I got told they could be cast out by the community for working with a white person. So, and, you know, so I'm really like, it is literally, it's, a film, it's so important to me, and I'm just like, this, 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 the myth about the, the black snake that all the tribes in the Native American world have, uh, which is, with that they, there's a prophecy, and they've been w warring with each other for thousands of years, and the prophecy was, if we, um, we will, you know, we'll be fighting until Black Snake comes, and then we'll have to get together and fight against the Black Snake to stop the end of the world from happening. And then for the Dakota Access Pipeline, which is a big oil pipeline that snakes through all of their lands, they all came together and fought about it because they knew that once the white men took their rights to their treaty lands away, they would uh, that that would be the beginning of the end for them and the beginning of the end for nature because they are the guardians of nature and they knew that would be the end. So it's this amazing story. Sorry, I just, <laughs> it just has to be told. And I'd say yeah. tell it. Like I, I personally don't agree with this this idea that if you're from outside a community, you can't tell a story about that community because it's it's slightly it goes back to what we were talking about a bit earlier. Even though writing can be quite solitary, there'll come a point where it becomes collaborative making a film. And you'll have advisors on board, you'll have people who can make sure that you're not doing anything with stereotyping or culturally insensitive. There will be, I would hope, points where you'll have people on board who are from that world and understand that world. And because it's, it's interesting, I, I write fiction on the side, and I was told at events I went to for authors similarly, like if you're writing a novel about in new bits in Canada and you're not from that, no one's going to touch you. And and I think at the end of the day in the arts people do sometimes run scared from things because they're scared of backlash or and it's an industry that is constantly relying on needing to drum up funds. So I think if, if something is badly handled, it could be that it escalates and then something that gets cancelled. But I personally I don't think unless you agree with me and then we've talked about this and it was in your mouth, but I'd say if you really feel a great urgency, and you clearly do to make this happen, then do. And 
But also I think personally there's nothing wrong with being honest with people and saying I just really love this story and want it to happen, but I don't think it's reasonable to bring in people who are in that community who also want to collaborate on this, I'd say. That would be my, my thing would be forge ahead. Yeah. Yeah. The second thing is just how to find them as well, sorry. But no, yeah. no, 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 yeah. Um, I, I don't disagree with that, basically. I mean, um, firstly, just to, the point I was making earlier in terms of like, what's commercial and what's being going to be signed off on is don't stuff like me. But if you have a story, it's just in the way, guys. But if your story is about that, and that's the story you need to tell, tell whatever story you want to tell. It's our big thing. Tell the story you want to tell. Um, which then obviously seems to basically agree with Maddie. I think what it is is that if this is the film you want to write, write that film. Um, you seem to be passionate enough about it, which is fantastic, that you will find people. You will you will find members of that community to talk to that will give you as much information as you can about it. That writers are incredible creatures, that your brains find things, find connections, find people to talk to because you care about the stories you want to tell. If you, and you clearly want to write this as sensitively as you possibly can, you will find the people you need to talk to to inform the script to make it as sensitive as, it, as you want it to be. In terms of a piece of practical advice, who is your protagonist? Are they a, are they a member of the community or are they a, a white no, person? No, it's, it's actually the, the whole point of it, and I think <coughs> if I do it well, it's actually about like white people who are in trouble, in the crisis themselves, finding themselves there, and like as outsiders, um, and then having, and then having a, an experience which is essentially healing. I think I think if you're if you and yeah and reality changing for them yeah. in the sense that they come online with what's needed. Yeah, I think that if your protagonists are trying to be politically sensitive and culturally sensitive, if your protagonists are from your demographic, that's all my getting around that. I kind of agree with Maddie on it's, diff it's a difficult political ground to tread on, um, so I'll be as careful as I possibly can. Um, is that I saying that you can't write about people that you don't understand means that we will never ever create any art ever again. I hope it's a blip. I it, feel it's a blip. I, I, th I, think, I think we're trying, I think as a cult community, wipe this out into a cultural conversation. I think as a culture, we're finding our way through how to be sensitive to all other groups. And which of course is terribly important, and um, and also as two white people, it's very easy for us to go. This is really hard for us. So um, no. um so we've got to be careful about doing that. Um, but I think it's just difficult. I think we have to be able to write write characters. We have to be as sensitive to those characters as we possibly can. The thing that I would making your, in terms of trying to be commercial about it and with my commercial head on, I think making your protagonists from your demographic is a safer thing to do. The other thing that I would be careful about is making sure that they don't become the community they interact with, they don't become, excuse me for using this term, magical ethnics. I'm sure they won't, but it's just like there's the thing that often happens is that white people discover the indigenous culture and they're saved by it, which can be simplifying, reductive, and patronising. Just as much as the white saviour. Exactly, but it's, it's that kind of thing of going, it's the, it's the avatar narrative of the white guy goes native and is suddenly saved. And it's like, that's... Yeah, you can't do it either way. No, I think, but, but, but there is a way of doing that story of actually engaging in nature in this ancient culture. And like my mum's reading this book, I can't remember what it's called, well, it's a book of foundations about um, Native American culture and it's, in, and it's associated with nature. And she says it's amazingly interesting, I don't remember what it's called. Um, there's a way of being sensitive about that culture without patronizing it. So I think the thing that might be useful for you is to take on that advice and try and be as positive as possible and go, okay, how can I be as res respectful as I possibly can? And to use and to check your privilege at every stage and go, am I making them? the ethnic version of the crazy pixie dream girl. Like, if at any point, and I find this is quite useful um, generally, is that if you find you're writing someone who isn't you, move it into, move that character into a demographic that might offend you. So, um, if I, 
or, or in a serious system of, of offence that you'd understand. So, like, I have a mother and a sister, and I don't know if somebody, if I was writing a character, an ethnic character, and then I changed the conversation into the being patronising about their gender, I go, that would really annoy my sister. So I'm not going to talk about them the same way about their race. So if you think, if you find a writing a character that's talking about someone's culture, and think, if they talk to me about my gender, for example, if a man, if a man talks to me about my femininity, the way that my white character is talking to my ethnic character about their culture, would that annoy me? Yes? Maybe I need to change that. Also says, well, like, stories, I think, are meant to be, they're meant to create empathy. I think, you know, Mark Cohen, the film critic, he's very fond of saying, like, films are empathy factories. Mm -hmm. And if we can't sort of write about stuff that's not for the world that we've been out for so long, then how do we even begin to, like, encourage empathy? So, um, but I'd also say, as well, even though this obviously has a message to it, the thing that you're doing, I'd say don't let the message for another story make it all about the story and everything else will follow. Like, and that, in some ways, will address some of the stuff we've talked about. I think make it about the characters and their journey, really. Um, I would do that just to add one more thing and then yeah. maybe have two more questions, maybe. Um, is that there is a. There's a danger sometimes I found with writers that they want their message and their politics to come through their film and they forget to tell us a story. Uh, a really good example of that is um, uh, the second Star Wars sequel, which is so obsessed with its politics, it doesn't tell us a story. Um, so be careful that your message doesn't overpower the story you have to tell. We like hearing stories about people going through struggles and then changing. Coming back to the structure thing I was talking about earlier. Make your film about a person going through a struggle and changing and becoming and growing as a human being, then your message will come through. If you write a film about a message, no one will want to listen to it because it's a piece of propaganda, not um, a story. So. I've got um there's a I've got an action trilogy project idea as well, which I'm I was looking to do. And then all of a sudden actually part of it says in Russia, for example. So how would you, if for example you are still believe in your story, but you, you know, obviously because of what's going on in Russia, it's very dangerous. I mean, what would be the solution to that? Would you make it a period thing, or would you sort of look for an alternative location to, you know, um, you know, just out of curiosity? I mean, what, what would you do? What is it that you're sorry, um, struggling with? Is it that you think you, it wouldn't work in film in Russia at the moment because it's too? Oh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. But, I, but what I'm interested in now is, I mean, you, that would just be a structural thing, or like you can actually, you just change the location, you know, just bring that into that. Yeah, like, I mean, I mean, filmmakers come up against this all the time, but they just can't film in the places where stuff is set. So, plenty of stuff that is set somewhere will be filmed somewhere else. So, I'd say if you're, if the location scout the producer is any good, then they will, they will deal with that. Yeah, no, no, yeah, exactly. And the the logistical thing is you can't do a shoot in Moscow right now because we don't like them. Um, but uh, also in terms of the writing thing, it depends how. Is it essential? For example, is it essential that they're Russian? Do they have to be Russian? Could they be from somewhere else? I mean, it's it's. I mean, the story is actually I've had this thing for years. It's a fictional railway line that runs from the backdrop of stories. It's a fictional railway line that runs from place to place. Bosnia, so it's a whole thing, and the whole conflict is based on this idea there's, you know, it's kind of a bit like, I don't know, an Addison, a wife and updated Addison McQueen type story, like Mission and stuff like that. So I was, I was just curious really, that's, you know. People film in, like, people shoot, I've heard of people shooting Chicago as New York, you know, and like, for, for any of you guys who watched Doctor Who or Sherlock Holmes, you'll know that Cardiff spends a large amount of its time being London. And so, it, yeah, they film, and, and London spends a lot of time, it's time being Gotham. Like, you can film places and make it look like other places. No, I, I mean, but. funny enough, you did remind me that, in fact, they shot Firefox, which is on ITV for every other week in Vienna, so yeah. And, like, you also, you do get some very intrepid filmmakers who will not take on war zones at home, you know, and it's, um, I mean, I don't know if you at the time, but, um, you know, uh, pockets that are, like, that almost killed the director. Like, you actually read the process of how they made that film and how many got made so Like, it's, and I think it was, yeah. We're not encouraging you to go and take your film crew in the dark, as general, I just want to put that out there. Well, we, as spirit lights, do not condone the making of a popular town. No, no, we don't. But, um, 
No one should die in the process. That's, that's a good rule to follow. But, uh, there are people with enough capacity to try and do that, but generally people will find a way around. Um, maybe one more question from the panel.
Oh, so two snakes. All right, cool. We've got 40 minutes. We can stay there. Um, no, but we should probably stop and talk to you guys for a long time. Yeah, over an hour. Um, but it's been fantastic. It's been great to talk to you about your projects. Thank you for sharing. Thank you so much for coming. You'll I see really, a lot of really, really appreciate it. paper hovering around. That has our contact details on it. Just a little bit of what we do. Please do get in touch with us. Drop us a line. Follow us on social media. And, you know, what we want to sound really exciting. We'd love to be involved. Well, so. really good. But yeah, please, please email us and say hello and tell us that you came to this thing and we'll be like, thank you so much for coming to our thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, please talk to us. That's what we're here for. So and yeah, we'll be hanging around for a bit if anyone wants to come ask us more questions. If you're too nervous to get out of that or anything. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much.